So welcome again, everyone, to the third Biopharma webinar, which is on practical collection and analysis of data to generate information products for specific policy needs with a case study from Malawi in this webinar. Um, the webinar will be structured with a number of speakers who will be just covering sections of the, the topic to be covered. First speaker will be Beryl Nyamgora, who is from IUCN, based in our Nairobi office. She's the technical officer for Biopharma for Eastern and Southern Africa and she's going to cover the goals and structure of the Biopharma Regional Resource Hub. She will then be followed by Ngugi Kimani, who is the GIT lead from the Regional Centre for Mapping of Resources for Development, who are our implementing partners um, for Biopharma for Eastern and Southern Africa. And he's going to explain the role of the Regional Resource Hub in the region and a little bit of background on RCMRD. And they, he is also based in Nairobi. Then we'll have Lucy Baston, who is from the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, and she's based in Ispra in Italy. And she's going to look at how Biopharma can build on RCMRD's expertise and data to support protected and conserved areas in the region. Then we'll have Tawangi Muzumara Gawa, who is the Mapping Biodiversity Priorities Lead for the Museums of Malawi. She's also a lecturer at the university. And she's going to give us a real, really practical example of Mapping Biodiversity Priorities for Malawi, the results of the project she worked on there, and lessons learned. And then um, Lucy will wrap up with how to share and explore this biodiversity information in the Biopharma Regional Resource Hub. Then we'll have a um, time at the end for discussion and questions. Please also, if you'd like to add any questions during the pre presentations, you can add them to the chat, either add them to everyone, or if you'd like to direct them to specifically to one of the speakers, please do so as well. And we really do hope that you'll enjoy this webinar. I'm going to hand over to Beryl now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. So as Sue has mentioned, my name is Beryl, a technical officer for the Eastern and Southern Africa <laughs> region. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of Biopharma uh, for, and an introduction of the regional resource hub. Okay, so Biopharma stands for Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program. It is a program that started in 2017 and will run up to the year 2023. It is an initiative of the African, Caribbean and Pacific uh, uh, group of states and is financed by the European Union's 11th European Development Fund. It is also jointly implemented by IUCN, that is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and uh, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. It will also be co-implemented by the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, and those are also our hosts for the Regional Resource Hub. The overall objective of Biopharma is to contribute to improving the long-term conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and natural resources in protected areas and surrounding communities through better use and monitoring of information and capacity, build, capacity development on management and governance. So Biopharma, uh, uh, as I've, I've mentioned before, is uh, an initiative of the Caribbean, Pacific, and African group of states. And we have four observatories that have been formed to achieve the objectives that I've just uh, read to you right now. So, so the regional resource hub for the ESA region will cover four, 24 countries, that is all the countries in the Eastern and Southern Africa, including the associated uh, islands. And the Regional Resource Hub host uh, will be the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development. That is the institution that uh, when an expression of interest uh, was put out by IUCN, it was selected because of their governmental mandate, uh, their geographical coverage with the 24 countries that IUCN also covers. It's relevant thematic expertise um, that includes some of the projects that they've already uh, done also that uh, are related to our theme as well. Uh, their technical capacity in data management, information systems, uh, web development, uh, their experience in hosting similar regional initiatives through other projects, uh, their sustainability. Uh, as we know, uh, RCMRD was established in 1975 and we're sure that uh, as, even as Biopharma project ends in 2023, uh, the resource hub will continue running even after that. And of course, their interest in hosting the, the regional resource hub. 
So what is the RRH? The Regional Resource Hub is basically a hub for data and analysis to support uh, reporting, monitoring, and decision making, customized for the needs of the region. It also provides analytical tools, uh, for example, the integrated management effectiveness tool that, has did, uh, that was developed by the Joint Research Center. Uh, it also provides products such as the State of Protected Areas Report that is currently under development. And it also provides services like capacity building. Uh, we've already carried out one capacity building in uh, management effectiveness uh, training with the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, another thing the Resource Hub does is to promote the networking of experts uh, in areas the relevant issues that link partners who are working together in such areas. It also provides information on training. Uh, in, uh, recently, the trainings that have, been, uh, that have been put forward are the Protected Areas Management Effectiveness and Protected Areas Governance and Equity Trainings, and also funding opportunities that will be through the Bioparma Action Component. This is another structure under Bioparma and, and will be covered in a different webinar. Uh, the regional resource I will also assist in the development of the State of Protected Areas report that I've just mentioned, and it will include providing data and information on the current state of protected areas in the region. It will highlight things like the key needs uh, in the countries in the region, uh, provide guiding strategies and funding decisions in the protected areas in East and Southern Africa. So in, in the development and implement implementation of the Regional Resource Hub, one of the major things is the Regional Reference Information Systems that will be hosted under, in, under the Regional Resource Hub. And it will be a platform, an online platform to facilitate exchange of data and information among decision makers and managers and other stakeholders in the region. It will also support uh, regional priorities for decision makers, support, uh, support for decision makers, such as the state of protected areas that I've mentioned, that you are currently developing and collecting data and working with the different institutions in the East and South Afri Southern African countries uh, to develop this report. So um, uh, what you can see is an illustration of the structure of the resource hub that we'll have in the region. Um, so as I've mentioned before, the information system is a major component of the Regional Resource Hub, and it, under it we'll have four sub-information systems that will cover the different sub-regions within Eastern and Southern Africa. So we'll have one, uh, and the sub-systems will be hosted within the regional economic communities, that is the East African community, the uh, Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the Indian Ocean, community, the Southern African Development Community, and then the SADAC uh, Transfrontier Trans Conservation Areas Portal, which uh, Bioparma is working together with SADAC to develop, uh, to develop this uh, portal. And also just to add that um, the RRH and the RIS will also link to other nat existing national uh, portals so that uh, the regional resource has become like a one-stop shop for any information that one may need on protected areas and conserved areas. Um, so that is the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, Ngugi Kimani of Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development to just expound on what I've already introduced here on the Regional Resource Hub. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Beryl. Um, and Gugi, are you going to share screen as well? Yes, um, thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you very much everybody for, for, for tuning in to this webinar. Uh, as you have heard, my name is uh, Michael Gugi Kimani. Um, uh, I come from the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development. Uh, we are one of the implementing uh, partners of uh, the Bioparma project. And, um, um, I'm going to be presenting uh, three items uh, this afternoon. First of all is uh, for, the, for the people who don't know RCMRD, 
uh, who we are and the role we play in Biopharma, then uh, the importance of the regional resource hub, um, uh, and then the capabilities of the regional resource hub in planning of uh, protected areas and uh, conservation. Um, the regional center, uh, it's an intergovernmental institution uh, owned and managed by 20 member states uh, from the northern part of Africa to the, part, to the southern part of Africa. Uh, we are, the headquarters are located in Nairobi and uh, we have focal points in all our member states. Uh, uh, we are a non-profit uh, making institution. Our activities are mostly funded by the projects uh, that we implement and design as well as advisory services that we offer to our member states. We also do a lot of capacity building uh, to all our member states, as well as uh, some, uh, we get some con contribution from our, our, our member states. Um, the specific role that we shall be playing uh, on the regional resource hub, we can naturally group it into four, four items. So the first thing, the regional resource hub will be a knowledge center. It will be the place where people can access data and information uh, as well as uh, as well as perform some analysis on how uh, those data sets that they have shared uh, uh, look like. Uh, the platform will also be used for decision making on uh, on issues that uh, can support uh, better governance and biodiversity conservation. Like for example, the state of the port, uh, the state of the protected areas report uh, shall be uploaded there, and uh, it will be cascaded to each particular country um, on its own. Then uh, we'll have tools and services that can be accessed uh, through the regional resource hub. The tools uh, are, for, for instance, for assessment tools that uh, can support issues to do with reporting and monitoring for the different stakeholders that uh, we have in the region. Uh, we shall also be supporting capacity building uh, uh, for institutions and uh, managers as well as local communities on uh, issues to do with protected area management, uh, management effectiveness as well as uh, protected area governance and uh, equity. Uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more precise, uh, some of the capabilities that the regional resource hub uh, shall be offering uh, in planning of uh, protected areas and conservation, we will be doing a pilot. Uh, the course of this year, we'll be doing a pilot. Uh, we'll do pilot country visits to, 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 to three countries, that is Madagascar, Botswana, and Tanzania. And the purpose of this visit is to see what exactly uh, do the countries want in terms of the regional resource hub? We will share the capabilities of the RRH. We will see what some, what we we'll try to get some insights of how the structure should be. We will also be collecting some data and uh, we will try to see how can we package all this information in one nice uh, portal where people can access all this information. We will also provide links to access to data sets and information per country. Uh, we use open data, uh, open data standards, so most of the data that we shall be putting there shall uh, be accessible within the platform, or in case you want to access it outside the platform, we will also provide a link of uh, doing that. The Regional Resource Hub uh, will also provide a platform for people to network and uh, institutions to share their knowledge on biodiversity conservation. We will also try to link the data that we shall have acquired with the information needs, especially the ones that are related to protected area management effectiveness, as well as the protected area governance and equity, as well as supporting capacity building in these particular two aspects. We also uh, coordinate technical and uh, policy support uh, initiatives uh, that are being done at the national level, as well as the regional level. Like for example, the one that uh, is currently under development, the state of protected area report, um, we'll be able to share that information. Then uh, we'll also uh, give uh, links and access to the regional information system. This will be the technical engine that uh, will provide a lot of analysis and uh, management of the data that will be will be will be in the will be will be for Biopharma. Uh, data sets will be accessed uh, at the regional level, at the country level, and even at uh, a site level. And uh, with this kind of information, uh, it will be easy for us to support issues with policy and linking it with uh, themes on uh, things such as protected areas, biodiversity, ecosystem, uh, species, habitats, uh, as well as uh, issues to do with climate change and, and so on. Um, that was my small presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, listening. Thanks very much, Ngugi. We'll hand over now to Lucy. 
Thank you, Ngugi. Um, my name is Lucy Bastin. Uh, as Sue mentioned, I'm from the Joint Research Centre in Italy, and we are the Science for Policy section of the European Commission. And uh, JRC is the technical partner on Bioparma, and so we're supporting a set of observatories across uh, Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. So in collaboration with partners like our CMRD, we're developing um, infrastructure, tools and services aimed at making biodiversity data more accessible and more usable for decision making. And RCMRD, uh, we were very happy that they have agreed to host the observatory, the, the resource hub, because they already collect and generate a really wide range of biophysical data. And that really helps us to set the scene for strategic planning of protected areas. Because the connectivity and the viability of protected areas is obviously dependent on human activities and needs in the wider landscape. So we can build on this really strong spatial data infrastructure by collating and bringing in a whole lot of different information at other scales relating to the more specific issues of protected areas. And this can come from a really wide range of sources, including local experts, including volunteer citizen scientists and obviously researchers and um, more authoritative and national reporting. So uh, our history in protected area uh, assessment and indicators, we have at a global level always computed, uh, been, been computing for a long time, indicators of state and pressure for protected areas in our digital observatory for protected areas. And this is looking at trends and patterns inside and around protected areas. So for example, the importance of a particular site for certain species, or here you're looking at the change in surrounding landscape and the agricultural um, change and pressure from uh, in a particular site inside and outside the protected area. So this was useful at a global level because we can kind of get a, a broad picture, but it's based on very coarse global data sets. So we have a really unique opportunity within Bioparma to drill down and to get more detailed, uh, relevant information at regional, national and site level. So to uh, bring in all the kind of information that is really needed if you want to represent and balance all the different pressures and values in a landscape and do systematic, strategic, spatial planning for the protected areas in a country. So in them, um, you've heard already that we are working currently on a state of protected areas report for Eastern and Southern Africa. And we, we did a first one for Eastern Africa in 2016. And this involved working with a really wide range of partners to test this approach of data collation and harmonization. And it really opened our eyes to the challenges of working at a regional scale. At that point, this was across five countries of EAC. So the challenges were that the conservation relevant data really varied in its nature, in its scales, in its themes, but also in its accessibility and the constraints that were placed on the use of that data. And you notice also that two of the themes that really came up were governance and management effectiveness. You will have seen from the, uh, the preceding presentations that these are strong focuses for Bioparma in the current phase. Uh, we are actively uh, aligning with and supporting the green list approach that badges protected areas which perform well. And then as mentioned by Beryl, there is an IMET tool specifically for um, measuring and monitoring to this end, but there's a range of different tools that can be used for these purposes. And in future webinars, we're going to go on to that topic in a lot more detail and showcase some recent examples. So Bioparma is aiming to make high quality data more accessible to decision makers, but that doesn't mean that all the data has to be stored and managed within one system because there are many, many different data portals out there. This is just a few examples from the huge number that I've been um, looking at recently. Um, they all contain potentially relevant information and accessing the data directly from these sources is appropriate because it means that you're not making multiple different copies of the data, it's managed by the proper authorities and you always know that what you're seeing is up to date. However, in this very complicated landscape, it can be really difficult to find the information that you need to work out how suitable it is for the purpose of your, that you want to use it for and also to identify whether there are particular constraints and restrictions on using that data. So because Biopharma has a commitment to open standards, uh, JRC, RCMRD and all our partners are committed to these um, open data. 
we can link all these different sources of information in a one-stop shop. So a stakeholder who's interested in a particular policy goal can easily identify available information for the theme they're interested in, for the region, for their planning or analysis. And the Regional Resource Hub is our platform for doing this through a set of tools we call the, re region, the Reference Information System. Uh, these tools were described in the first and second webinars. And the approach of the Reference Information System, the RIS, is to collate policies which are related to protected areas at all different levels, global, regional, national and local and to identify indicators that can be used to monitor progress towards the targets that are flowing from those policies. So these indicators could be computed using tools and service systems within the RIS, or they may be outputs from other national or regional projects that have all been found and brought together. So a lot of this is about networking, is about finding information, sharing best practice, supporting a knowledge community. And we wanna, we want to support a community that can share le tips, lessons and best practice, especially because pulling together these different data types from very different sources can be challenging, but no one ever wants to talk about the challenges or the problems or the obstacles or the failures because it, it's not good publicity. Um, so we, we need to maybe get a bit more open about sharing this, uh, not, not just the things that are easy, but also the things that are hard and how people have being creative in tackling particular problems of uh, data analysis. Um, I would just like to note here, I would really like to invite all of you to join our Yammer network if you're not already part of it, because this is one of the key mechanisms through which we're doing this connection. So recently we heard about a biodiversity analysis that was generating really interesting information products, and we have invited the project lead to our webinar today. So Dr. Gower led the mapping of biodiversity priorities for Malawi, and she has agreed to share with us the early results of this work. So welcome, Duonga, and I will give you the floor. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, so um, these are the slides. Uh, I'm afraid that we've lost our star presenter <laughs> just at the moment when she was about to start. Um, would you, Sue, would you like me to kind of step through these or? Uh, yeah, I see Matthew, Matt is online, so I don't know if you'd like to. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I'm sure she'll rejoin. Uh, sorry, the connection in Malawi, we did have a couple of problems the other day, but mostly. Matt, would you like to give us a bit of an insight? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I can give you a bit of background um, about the project. Um, so this is a um, a project that is being funded by the Japan um, Biodiversity Fund uh, at the at the CBD Secretariat. And it's jointly coordinated by uh, UNFWCMC and SAMBI. And we're working in three countries, namely Malawi, Ethiopia, and Botswana. And the idea, um, the, the background to this was uh, SAMBI and UNFWCMC produced what, uh, what we called Mapping Biodiversity Practice Guidelines. And this is just a kind of toolkit to, to produce a national um, biodiversity assessment by looking at um, ecosystem types and condition, um, setting targets and then setting priorities. And so we wanted to test uh, how these guidelines could be applied um, on national scales in different kind of uh, data rich environments, so to speak. And also just to see um, how tractable the uptake of this uh, information product, quote unquote, would be in different sectors. Um, yeah, so that's why uh, Tiongo has got that objective over there, which is the uh, to test these these guidelines. So it involved it involved both the kind of technical components. Obviously, uh, we were working with um, uh, GIS technicians in each country, but also the policy link. So we had um, non-technical kind of policy making uh, or policy experts in each country as well. And just to um, point out, maybe this, maybe Tiongo was going to touch on this later, but that um, aspect of bringing together both the technical and the policy people um, into the same kind of assessment workshops actually 
worked really nicely because um, I think often uh, policy guys don't understand the kind of data requirements and the processes that are required to input data into products like this. So there was a kind of data legitimizing effect um, that went into this. And it also helped the technical um, team to understand kind of fitness for use of the data and what other data might might go into, into the product in the future. So yeah, and just to um, maybe maybe I can just touch on where we are with the project. So um, so Tuongo is going to present on the on this draft product that we just finished. The assessment workshop for that was I think last August, August 2018. And we're about to embark on a series of what we call stakeholder workshops where each country will um, each, each team will present their draft product to different stakeholders and assess how um, and assess the uptake. I see Tuongwe has just joined us. Um, so let me just finish my thoughts and then I'll let her uh, take over. But yeah, so the, the idea is this, this is going to be an evolving process. So we're going to present the, the uh, assessment to, to different stakeholders, get their feedback on how it can be improved. Uh, hopefully get some more data sets that can be incorporated and then have a national kind of launch for the product. And then, then um, hopefully we can institutionalize this assessment so that uh, there'll be a continuous kind of data pipeline to go in, into it um, so that the product can be enhanced at finer and finer, finer spatial scales, which will enable it um, to obviously feed into spatial planning across sectors, not just, not just protected area expansion, but um, mining development, agriculture, infrastructure, that kind of thing. So um, can everyone hear me, by the way? I feel like I'm talking yeah. to myself. OK, great. No, uh, was... Tiwangwe, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. OK, great. So I, I just I just started on your behalf. But um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just keep quiet. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. Tawangi, are you happy for Lucy to, you can just tell her next slide, if that works for you, then it'll be less bandwidth for you. Yes, please. I, I don't know why, for some reason, my computer just logged me out and then I'm having to connect from the phone. So yeah, if Lucy, you can just um, share the slides and I will, I'll speak uh, okay. to them. So she's on the, yeah, the MPB objective slide for now. Thanks, Tawanga. Okay, so um, hi, ev hello everyone. I'm Tuong Gagawa and I work for the Malawi University of Science and Technology. And I, I was involved in this project uh, on mapping biodiversity priorities. And this, uh, the objective for this project was really to um, sort of build some evidence of the approach. So the approach that is, uh, there's a publication for mapping biodiversity priorities that was published and it was really to show, to say, to show that this, whether this work, um, the, the methodology rather that is there can be used in an actual setting and actually demonstrate how it can be used for the, uh, the NBSAP or the this national biodiversity priorities, or even for other sectors, like to guide um, other sectors in their spatial planning and, and the like. Next, please. So this, um, the information product that we we're producing, so this was really an ecosystem a status map that would be the product. And it was, a big, our first audience was the environmental affairs department who obviously wanted um, to, to use this as also some, uh, as a way that they can inform, you know, other sectors about what are the, what is the status of our ecosystems and you know if any of them are endangered and and things like that but we also thought this is an information product like i said that can be used with other sectors like agriculture economic development uh, economic development and planning department so because they work at the national level and this map was just going to sort of give us an idea on though the different ecosystem types that we have in malawi what is their status across um, across the country Next. So um, to do this work, the, uh, the data that we had to gather was a lot more of spatial data. So we needed spatial data that was covering the whole country, different types of, of uh, spatial data that 
basically covered the whole country and we could be able to do this different uh, different assessments. So whether it was vegetation, rivers, uh, whatever it was, it needed to cover the whole of uh, the whole of the country. And we needed this data to be in poly and polygon form formats. So we found that very quickly that yeah, a lot, there was a lot of data sets that were in point form, especially a lot of them to do with uh, water, fresh water systems. So a lot of the water department most of the sampling that they do, they really just, you know, record on a, at a point and not, you know, ne not necessarily, you know, make their data into any type of informative uh, polygons. Next. <laughs> okay, so there are four key analysis steps for, uh, for this process that we, for this project that we're doing. And the first one was to map the ecosystem types. So we had to come up with an ecosystem types map. I'll go through each one of these uh, in detail just shortly. Then the other important map is the, uh, the ecological conditioning map. Then we also have a map of protected areas. Um, and then there was also a, uh, an aspect where we had to do the the analysis. Um, Lucy, the, my computer has just come back home. Shall I try it? Which is the Visia, the East, East Africa map uh, that was made, I think, in the 1999. Thanks. So we, the vegetation map, we had to uh, do some changes to it. Because in that map, there's a, a certain large area uh, of Miombo that shows just as if it's one time from the northern part of Malawi all the way to the, to the, which was to the southern tip, which is not true. And it was very important here to have um, the experts or, that, uh, that know these areas and agree that this map was not true in that way. Because though it is Miombo, but it is different in terms of its composition, but also in its structure. Those of us that have gone to these places, we know that it's not all the same type of miombo. So using that, we split that uh, particular uh, layer to, to show the, de the designation. So, and we also use the publication by White and, and Dorset and Dorset Leme and Dorset, which also defines the different types of miombo in those different um, areas. So we use that plus expert knowledge to split uh, that particular layer. Then we had the wetlands layer, which combined marshes and dambos. And we also had the rivers, which were buffered and grouped by basins. So for the wetlands, we named them from the vegetation type. So depending on which vegetation type the wetland was placed, it was named after that. And then for rivers, we used there's a, a, a national uh, basin. So they, they are, I think, a number of about nine basins that are recognized in the country. So we named also the rivers after the, those basins that they, they fell in. And then when we combined this together, we had the wetlands over the rivers and then over the, the vegetation type to, to create this particular ecosystem layer. Then we had to generate an ecological conditions layer. So this was mainly to split what was natural and what is not natural. And what we considered not natural were road, uh, roads, crop plants, urban areas, you know, forest plantations, dams, and mining. So these are the places that we, we pulled out of our land cover map for 2010, and we defined these natural, these areas as not natural, and everything, you know, everything else then would be, uh, would be natural. Of course, we had some areas that we'd call semi-natural, and uh, uh, for this particular analysis, we didn't define this because it was, it was a bit difficult, so we, we simply had the hardcore not naturals and the semi naturals went into uh, what would be uh, na uh, natural. So look at the next slide. It shows you about the urban uh, layer. So we had two urban layers. We had one from the, our land cover and one from the global, I think there was a global map that was generated by the EU uh, on urban areas. But when we zoomed in, this picture here just shows the when you zoom into some of these areas, you find that the yellow marking is that from the uh, Malawi land cover, and the red one is that from the EU. So there are many places like this where you see some things 
the Malawi land cover map picks up and the EU one didn't pick up, but also some things that the EU one picked up and the Malawi one didn't pick up. So because of those, for the urban layer, we used both of these files to define what our urban layers were so that we, we got a good coverage. And uh, so that's how the outcome of HUT was the ecological conditioning. And those of you that don't know Malawi, this is very true where a lot of our places are, are, are not natural and we have quite a few that are uh, natural. And then the last one was the uh, of the maps was the protected areas map. So this was probably one of the easier maps because we simply uh, used the protected areas, gazetted protected areas that we that we used in this place. But we recognized that there were many other effective protected areas that should have been included. So for example, graveyards, graveyards in Malawi are natural places. So often, oftentimes, even though you find in a village the forested area will be the graveyard because they'll keep it natural and people don't cut trees. Uh, nature sanctuaries, botanical gardens, there's bird sanctuaries and fish sanctuaries, which are all um, uh, protected areas. And they, but we don't have any shape files that represent these, so we couldn't use them. A lot of the where was point data, as I mentioned. So unfortunately, uh, we couldn't use these. We only used those that were protected and gazetted areas. and we hope this can be included another time. Next. And then um, going on to the analysis, we we did the analysis in, in ArcMap and because we're dealing with this uh, special data and I had some background on, 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 uh, on, on using ArcGIS and this project sort of sharpened my skills because I, I hadn't used it for some time, but we, we also had uh, some experts, um, Stephen Hornes, who worked with us and took us step by step through the process. And when we were doing this analysis, we had the policymakers um, also there and also some of the representing the ecologists also there so that they understood what, you know, each of the steps that I've explained to you, what has gone into each map and what we are now doing in the particular analysis. Because basically what we were doing with the analysis is now uh, that's target. So the same way that IUCN, does its red list for species and you have, you know, particular when a certain habitat has reduced by a certain amount of, of area of, sorry, a certain population, you can say it's endangered or, or this and that. So we had to set those kind of targets for these ecosystem types. How much of it was in protected areas? How much of it was remaining from its original extent? And, you know, of that, how much is protected and how much is not? So these were the different targets that we, we set out to, to put um, to, to, through this analysis. Next. So um, this slide um, just gives, I mean, just shows what I, I was explaining. So this is the fourth step of setting those ta targets. And I don't know how well you can see um, in into this, um, but you'll find that we had, you know, the, what was the historic range of this of the of that area? Then we had we set out the the targets. For example, I think for protected uh, for Akaiki, they I think it's 17 percent of the of the uh, ecosystem type has to be protected. I can't remember the exact percentages, but we have this kind. And then also for other um, systems, we said, you know, we can say. If we have an ecosystem, at least 20% of it should be protected. You know, maybe 40% of it should be um, in its maybe it's not even though it's not protected, but it's in its natural form or semi-natural. And then only 40% of it should have been uh, completely changed to a natural, which is not in, or in an, to an universal state. So we set those kind of targets, and we're basically calculating uh, the different percentages, and this just shows. And you see, you know, depending on what the remnant was or the percentage, we would define as whether it's something is critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, or least concern. So this was, um, in brief, what what would happen. And uh, the output from that, you see, will you find um, these two maps here. The, the one shows the protected level. So this is the one that said, you know using say the al Kaiki standards uh, how much uh, so the Aichi standards 
how much of it is protected and how much of it is um, is not which one is well or rather which one is well represented in a protected area which is moderately represented and the like and you see the status map on the other side and very clearly you see that habitat where we have the circle which is not well represented in the in protected areas and if you if we the previous slide will also show you that um, the majority of it uh, is, is is not protected and a lot of it has been already converted uh, from its natural state and it comes out very clearly there as critically endangered. So this was very um, eye-opening because this is an area that not many actually most, most of us have now said oh this is an area that we should visit and this particular ecosystem type was Terminalia sericea, uh, wet, a wetland in the Terminalia sericea vegetation. I'm not a, a botanist so I don't know uh, what this is but um, you find that this is the majority of that endangered habitat is there and we've really looked at it was really eye-opening that we need to go nobody knows exactly it's an area near Lake Chibuta close to the Mozambique border that needs to be looked at another thing that came out clearly from this map was you see how green our lake is you know it shows us least concern but this only this is only because we didn't have data for the lake so we couldn't include it and so that's why everything shows like that and also this was an important outcome in that it, we didn't expect it, but it showed us that we really need some special data that defines our lake system. Next slide. So uh, some of the challenges when we did this process was, as I mentioned, the lack of countrywide by uh, spatial data that we could use for this assessment. There had not been any other ecosystem assessments, so we didn't have anything to fall back on. Uh, so that was a, a real uh, problem. And the, some of the key, some of the key data sets that we needed to use were were easy, but most of them we should have loved. Like you saw, the protected areas. There's a lot of them that we left out, which make a significant area that we couldn't, uh, we simply didn't have the data for. And this water water data that is mainly in point form uh, provide for, was quite a challenge. And also another problem was the. Um, the environment affairs department you know, wanted these kind of answers where you can talk about species data and and those kind of things which we couldn't say from what we were doing this analysis just showed us the different types of ecosystems and which ones are endangered but of course you could refer and say if this is endangered like this or critically endangered then the species that are in it also must be facing some serious threats another one the next slide uh, some of the lessons learned is we have to be we had to be realistic about the data that is available and um, the formats that they in and the uh, the extent that the data covered. So we left out a lot of things that we we couldn't we simply couldn't use. Um, it was good to have somebody in the team who's really good with GIS to to be able to do all these processes. Ecologists were key also to help us understand what the maps were showing and what they weren't showing. So these were important uh, processes. And that next slide. And what I think is also the key lesson here is that you know it is possible to come out with an, an a product that informs because even though we didn't have all the data that we wanted, we did come up with the product that we wanted, which shows us the status of our ecosystems in, in Malawi. It showed us where there is lack of information that we need to do more. Even the Miombo, you see it still comes out a lot green here, it means there's still a little bit that we need to do to define that better and letting us of that ecosystem uh, at Lake Chibuta there that we really need to go and we need to prioritize to go to. Next, and I think that's about it and that's the team that I was working with uh, on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Tuwonga. Thank you for being very persistent and flexible and managing to share that with us. So we um, wanted to understand the importance of this research. And to do that, we looked through the Malawi MBSAP. And it became really clear that this work underpins many of the actions and the indicators specified there. It's a, it's a real baseline for assessing the progress towards a lot of these targets. So we chose one target in particular, one action and uh, indicator, uh, associated with identifying degraded habitats, because that's uh, quite an important thing that this work has done 
uh, and it equates pretty well to those threat categories that have been allocated and the more nuanced data that lies underneath them. So the work that Tuonga just presented is going to be launched very soon, the research, and uh, the maps that have been produced are very probably going to be hosted in um, a national portal, which will make them accessible to other users and systems, uh, including the re re regional resource hub. So uh, our plan would be to, to access this data and to um, visualize it from the source. But temporarily, just for this webinar, as a proof of concept, we have temporarily hosted the data on our Biopharma spatial catalog, which is based on GeoNode. And you can see that we've, we've set up a map legend which is combining these two classes. The two different maps are effectively combined into one here. Um, to distinguish the different kinds of pressures and actions that are needed to support these ecotypes. So looking at our reference information system, uh, a user who's coming in and they're, they're coming in with an interest in Malawi and looking for uh, national level policy information, they first see some summary statistics for Malawi and then they have an option to go to a next page where they can drill down into a lot more detail. And here, there's a whole range of different information here, but under the responses, these are the policies that are specific. So at a global level, IT target 11 will apply. Uh, something much more specific might be in place at a local site. And at a national level, we have the MBSAP here, which has been uploaded into the system. And we've linked this map as an indicator to the target that I just mentioned on um, degraded terrestrial habitats, because this is what's going to be needed in order to monitor progress on restoration and protection. So following through from there, if you follow that link, you see an indicator card here, which is showing um, here, here, the graph on the left has been zoomed right into the left-hand side of, of the graph. So these are quite interactive, these charts. I, um, haven't, I'm not going to show it live because I don't think we have time left, but um, here we've zoomed into the most threatened habitats. So these red bars are showing the amount of remnant habitat which is uh, actually still there. And then the blue bars is showing the proportion of protection. So effectively on the chart, we've zoomed into the classes which are on the right hand side of this square legend here, the ones which are critically endangered. And we can pick out quite easily which, which of those areas are least protected, either from the chart, because you can see that the blue bars are absolutely minuscule or non-existent, like those wetlands that Tiwonga just highlighted. But also we can see those ecotypes where there are data gaps. So the fact that, for example, here that the whole of the lake is covered in pink and classified as least concern, that the Mionbo is not, um, is not discriminated in any way. And it reflects the fact that without more information, it's not possible to, in, to discriminate, for example, individual freshwater habitats that could be more subject to specific pressures. So this is an interface in which we hope that the data can be given a bit of a context, made findable, made usable, um, uh, and can you know, produce interesting maps, can be brought together with other data sets without having to upload everything in our system. We can actually access it from wherever it gets published. So that's just a quick example of how an information product like this could be presented in the resource hub. And finally, I'd just like to say we, we really appreciated the opportunity to, to, to hear about this work and to visualize these results. And we look forward to being able to help disseminate this, uh, this information and uh, make it usable, make it, get it to the attention of decision makers. So thank you to the team here, especially James and Martino, who, who helped a lot with putting together this technical demonstration. Great. Thanks very much, um, Lucy Tuanga and Ngugi and Beryl um, for the presentations. And yeah, once again, sorry about the technology issues that we had, but I hope that everyone was able to learn um, something about what the Resource Hub can do and what countries are doing. Um, the questions that we had earlier from Taruku, um, we have been chatting a little bit in the, the, the chat. Um, I've been giving some answers there already just because of a, the time issue. But um, we are working very closely with UNFWCMC in terms of the world database and protected areas um, and linking to that rather than any duplication or replication of effort. And um, Gugi can respond on the RCMID efforts to link to Ethiopia, but also RCMID is also working very closely um, with the WCMC. And Gugi, would you like to just step in in terms of how you can link to the Ethiopian system? Um, just to let you know that um, 
Uh, Tariku is from the Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute. He's the GIS expert um, for the Mapping Biodiversity Protected Area project there in Ethiopia. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Sue, and uh, also thanks also to Tariku. Uh, we one of our focal points in Ethiopia is the Ethiopia Mapping Agency. Uh, they changed their name to the Geospatial uh, Agency. And uh, what we can do, Tariku, is uh, probably we can get in touch uh, through email. You can share with us the the, the, the portal or the, the geoportal that you have. And then we can see the modalities that uh, we can use to provide any support uh, that uh, you would require. Uh, I would also say that the regional resource hub can be linked to the geoportal that you already have. You don't have to abandon what you already have. Uh, we can uh, share the data sets that uh, we have in both geoportals so that whoever bumps into, whoever goes to your geoportal can access what you have and whoever comes to the Bacoma geoportal can still access what you have. So we'll follow this conversation offline. Thank you. Super, thanks very much, Ngugi. And in terms of Biopalma in general, I did just chat to Tariku um, briefly about that we're working with Matuma at um, the Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute, and um, he is going to link with him just to see how we can support them in other ways as well, and what we are doing already with them in terms of the State of Protected Areas report. Um, do you have any other questions? Any, or anyone else? Yeah. May I continue? Yes, certainly. Go ahead. Fine. Uh, thank you. So I use this uh, information and uh, communicate with, especially with the uh, RSA Marley. For the Malawi cases, just uh, we are uh, up, we are implementing the same project. Ethiopia Malawi and the Botswana is piloted. It's a good opportunity for me to to see their presentation. The one point. Uh, just we are we are trying to develop the geo portal, uh, the same geo node approach, and then good opportunity for us to just get lesson from the Malawi uh, experience, and then we need uh, some assistance from EU, uh, Biopama, to give uh, similar uh, assistance like the the Malawi cases. So after in June. From June 3 up to 7, we'll have uh, a biodiversity planning forum at uh, South Africa. So hope that the Malawi team, we can meet there. And then we can uh, explore more your experience to easily uh, develop our geo portal. It, just a similar, similar approach with the Malawi. So this is a good opportunity for me. So the Malawi team. So we can communicate through email till we meet uh, at the South Africa. And thank you for the Kenyan uh, uh, respondent also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Matt and Tuange, are you going to be at that workshop in South Africa in June, either of you, just to connect? Uh, yes, we both will be. So it'll be an exciting opportunity. Mm. Fantastic. Any other questions from anyone else? Um, I see there's a message from James um, quickly to Tuange. Which IUCN criteria did you use for your red list of ecosystems? We are planning on undertaking one in the coral reef. I don't know, um, James, if you want to, to answer on now or later, Tuange, do you know which criteria you used for that? We use the uh, the ICN criteria session. I cannot uh, recall which one. Yeah, if we did, I think I, I can check and then uh, can respond to him on this. Perfect. Um, I'll share James's um, contact details and emails with you if that's all right with you, James. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me. The ICN criteria is they. You can you can find the same criteria from the IUCN ecosystem ecosystem assessment criteria. You can browse the, the their site. They already put in their IUCN website ecosystem assessment criteria. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Yes. Sorry. There is a there's a whole um, section on the IUCN website, James. I can send you that link as well. Sorry, I thought you were referring to something else, but um, I can share that with you as well. Um, right. 
So I will do that for James. Um, thank you. If there are no other questions, I just want to once again thank all the speakers and everyone in the background who helped with the technology and setting up all the slides and the maps and everything. We really appreciate it. And I think in terms of webinars going forward, Lucy did mention we will be um, linking to other webinars on um, assessment types and tools. So uh, please do stay in touch. If you're not on our mailing list and would like to be, please just send me your details in the chat now and I'll add you to the mailing list where we do send updates on the webinars as well as other activities and opportunities. But thank you all very much and have a wonderful um, afternoon. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you.